Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Devani. Um, this uh, next talk is going to be with Neil Woodfine. We're looking forward to that. He's he has got a profound knowledge of Bitcoin, the you know the ethical principles of Bitcoin, the vision, the ethos. Um, so check out uh, definitely his his uh, Twitter handle is N Woodfine. And uh, there was a um, you know recently or some time ago a Twitter uh, thread. Uh, uh, storm which went very viral uh, about you know what what happens when the internet shuts down and um, or power grid shuts off so he he had done a presentation in in October uh, 2019 in Switzerland Zurich uh, on the technological you know options possibilities and which is pretty good summarized in the article decrypt.co with the title, What Good is Bitcoin if the Internet Fails? Blockstreams Neil Woodfind lays out the solutions developers are working on to make Bitcoin impervious to interference. And, you know, and uh, I think he, he's pretty much on the same page as I'm, uh, you know, that I think critical adoption, mass adoption is truly possible. And the technology just needs to mature, of course, and to process and to develop. But um, he's also of the opinion when it comes to things like custody, surveillance, uh, privacy, um, all these things, you know, uh, there, there are possibilities to, uh, or, or security, you know, so, um, so he, he, he is also of the opinion that, you know, that, uh, that the tools are realistically, uh, uh, you know, r realistic to build and to, to implement and education, of course, is uh, is paramount to this whole thing. But making the tools more easily accessible is really the way to go. And yeah, without further ado, I hope you're gonna love this as much as I'm gonna do. And please leave me any positive review. I would pre really appreciate that on any podcast platform. Write me to hello at thetotalconnector.com. Without further ado, this is my talk with Neil Woodfine. Thank you so much for listening. For Hey Neil, welcome to the show, to the Total Bitcoin Show. Um, how are you doing, man? Hi, Kevin. Doing really good. Thanks, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, listen, uh, Neil. So I've had, uh, uh, I've been following you, you know, for some time now, and and your uh, one of your Twitter threads, which is based actually on the presentation you gave in Zurich, I think, right? It was last October. Um, That's right. Yeah. In Switzerland, yeah. So um, it was uh, just to break it down, you know, for my listeners. It was about like the topic was what if the internet breaks down, or there's a, there's a shutdown, or there's a shutdown of the power grid. What what are the options? What are the technological realistic possibilities? And it was also pretty good summarized in an article on uh, decrypt. .co, what good is Bitcoin if the internet fails with the subtitle block streams Neil Woodfine lays out the solutions developers are working on to make Bitcoin impervious to in interference. Now, before we go into uh, you know, all kinds of details, uh, Neil, for my listeners who might not have heard, but I'm sure most, most of my listeners do know you, uh, uh, what I'm really curious about uh, what's your background? Uh, I know you're, you know, in the marketing department of Blockstream, uh, but what's your path to Bitcoin? What is your vision? What was the aha moment when you understood Bitcoin? And yeah, just tell me a little bit about yourself. Thanks so much. No worries. Um, so like many others, I, um, I got into Bitcoin because the price was going up. Um, that was in 2013. Um, uh, I very quickly became completely obsessed, um, partly because I caught the the, um, uh, the tail end of the bull run in 2013, which was obviously very exciting. Um, and that sent me kind of on a research spree where I spent a lot of my uh, days uh, reading about Bitcoin. It got me hooked. So when the price started going down, um, it wasn't a big deal for me. I was kind of convinced that this was kind of uh, um, a technology with... Um, a lot of promise and um, I decided so I was working in the manufacturing industry in China at the time um, in cement and um, I decided that I had to get into the Bitcoin industry at all costs obviously looked a lot more exciting and um, probably a lot of interesting opportunities in the future so um, I joined OKCoin um, starting off as pretty much just kind of like a, a customer service rep 
uh, and then um, quickly moving on to doing business development. Um, I left OKCoin after a year, started a um, cross-border payments startup called Remitzi with one of my um, OKCoin colleagues, uh, Richard Bensberg. Um, we did that for a year and a bit, and then we sold that to a company called Wire. We worked at Wire for a year and then left that, and now I'm working at Blockstream doing marketing. Um, and during that time, I've been consistently obsessed with Bitcoin, both at work and in, in my personal life. Um, I used to run the Bitcoin meetup in Beijing for four years uh, before leaving. Um, and now run a very small Bitcoin only meetup in, in Chiang Mai where I'm based. And you speak Chinese as we've just, uh, we've just been talking before. It's yes, hilarious. Yeah, I, I speak, uh, speak Chinese after a, a good few years living there. Uh, what other languages do you speak besides Chinese? Just, just English and Chinese. I learned French at school for five years and I've forgotten all of it. Okay, um, cool. So I'm, right. I'm happy to stick to two. <laughs> Okay. No, that's really, you know, uh, like um, being in command of a, of a especially exotic language, I mean, I would call it exotic, you know, like Chinese is really precious, you know, it's like nobody can take it away from you. It's, you can get anywhere, right, with this language, especially, you know, if you're sort of a, like a native speaker to them. Yes, it's very useful. Um, and I think increasingly, um, so I've been um, speaking it for like 14 years or something now. Um, Increasingly, I'm discovering that more and more kind of non-Chinese people are also able to speak Chinese if they can't speak good English. So it's useful for communicating in Thailand, for instance. Sometimes you can find somebody who'll, who'll speak Chinese but not speak great English. So, um, it's definitely kind of becoming an, an international language. And then even without that, you can speak to 1.3, 1.4 billion people, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so Neil, um, I've had the chance to um, my last interviews um, talk to Richard Myers from Global Mesh Mesh Lab Networks, um, Randy oh, Brito, excellent. yeah, Randy Brito of uh, Locha Mesh, and uh, yeah, those are like the most important uh, figures when it comes to you know to developing technology, practical technology, you know, for the average. Uh, not only average, but you know, people in in disenfranchised countries or or uh, countries where there's sanctions or Iran, where there was you know uh, uh, internet shutdown down to three four percent or even lower. Uh, now it's back up again, but you know it's it's about um, surveillance, censorship, um, sanctions, uh, countries with inflation, hyperinflation. So without further ado. Uh, Neil, can you use a little bit bef uh, before we go into my questions, give a little bit of still a brief overview. What was the intention behind that presentation you gave in Zurich and, you know, the true threat about what is possible, you know, with, with um, local mesh networks, uh, low bandwidth radio signals, uh, block stream satellites, what is practical, what is realistic right now? Um. Yeah, so um, I've been working at uh, Blockstream for almost a year and a half now. Um, and Blockstream Satellite was something that I was familiar with, but hadn't really um, got very close to. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I used to get asked a lot of questions about it. It um, gets us in the media quite a lot, like Bitcoin satellites are quite like a sexy proposition. Um, and then, uh, so I was speaking to the guys at the, um, uh, the uh, Swiss um, Swiss Bitcoin Association, and uh, they were interested in having me over to talk. And we were like working out some potential topics. And satellite was um, one of the top, of the, well, it's basically top of the list. So um, I was like, okay, I'll I'll give that a shot. And um, I realized to be able to do the presentation, I was going to have to do a lot more research. Um, and like I, I I didn't want to just focus on Blockstream technology because um, I didn't want to just do kind of an advertorial when I went there. So I decided like, let's tie this into a broader subject of using Bitcoin without the internet. Um, and so I spent like a couple of days um, doing a bunch of research and I realized quite, like how interesting all of this was, how important Blockstream satellite was as a piece of the puzzle for making Bitcoin um, accessible and operational offline. Um, and uh, so I put together the presentation, presented in uh, uh, in Switzerland, and then um, 
I just figured it was an interesting topic to do a tweet storm on. I'd been thinking about it a little bit more after the after the event. So um, yeah, I, I put it out there. It's something that I've been putting off for a while. Uh, I think it was quite a big, it was like two or three months between um, the actual presentation and my uh, tweet storm. But um, yeah, it was worthwhile. I got a good response on the, um, on the tweet storm. And I think it really helped people understand where Blockstream Satellite fits into all of this, but also kind of how resilient the Bitcoin network already is um, against potential threats, such as like um, internet outages, um, government interventions, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, now in your, um, in a presentation or in the article, which is, uh, you know, um, pretty good summarized, you, there, there, are, there is a point where, um, where one has to think about, um, I mean, I call it like independence from the internet, but somewhere along those lines, you need, would you need like at least one, one basic internet connection to, to connect it in principle to the, to the mesh network? Or can you like elaborate a little bit? Like wh how independent is it really from the internet nowadays? Yeah. So, I mean, if, if the entire internet, uh, went down for whatever reason, Bitcoin would be in serious trouble. Um, there's no getting around that fact. And, um, despite the fact that the presentation was described as offline, Bitcoin solutions is really internet minimized um, rather than purely offline. Um, so like, uh, for instance, mesh networks would be considered a, a last mile technology. So they allow people at the edges of the network um, to, create, uh, to transact, but those transactions ultimately need to be broadcast onto the internet at some point so that they can reach the Bitcoin miners so that they can be um, mined onto the blockchain. Um, and then the Blockstream satellite is just there to um, run a full node and verify all of the transactions without the internet. It doesn't solve that, that problem of getting the, the actual committed transactions to the, to the, um, to the blockchain. And to get the, those transactions to the blockchain, the pretty, pretty much the only kind of scalable solution is the internet. Um, Potentially, you could maybe use radio to do that. Like you could have like a radio um, uh, access point and that broadcasts the transactions around the world. And then that's picked up by miners to mine on the blockchain. Um, but yeah, you, you, it'd be very difficult to construct um, a, work, a workable serviceable network without the internet existing somewhere, basically. Okay, so you need somewhere, somehow, uh principal point of connection some because um, i'm not a techie so so if there's you know like in iran was was like a total not a total but like almost 97 98 percent internet shutdown but there is still uh i mean that's what i'm trying to figure out like uh, is it is it really that hard then to to find some access point to the internet or just to yeah okay so i mean uh let's not use any specific uh, country as an example, but let's just say country X um, doesn't have any internet. Now, maybe it doesn't have the infrastructure or it's been shut down by a government. Um, you could have um, a local community using a mesh network to um, communicate transactions to each other. But the problem is there, um, so if I receive a transaction from you across this mesh network, how do I know that this uh, transaction um, has gone through and has been mined onto the Bitcoin network. I need to be able to verify that on my full node. My full node needs a copy of the most current blockchain. So the way to solve that is to set up, um, I would set up a, or if I'm sending the transaction to you, you would set up a Blockstream satellite. Um, the Blockstream satellite would download um, the, the latest blockchain data um, onto your Bitcoin full node and any transaction that I sent to you, you could verify that that has actually been applied to the um, Bitcoin blockchain. But the question is for the transaction that I sent to you, how do we get that onto the internet in the first place? Mm -hmm. And the, the only way to do that is for us to send that, that completed transaction across the mesh network. Maybe it does three hops, four hops, five hops. It finally gets to um, a relay and that person somehow has got a connection to the internet. So they, um, they may have, uh, for instance, the, the, the easiest thing is that they've just got a, a broadband connection for whatever reason. Um, and that means that we've got this whole community connected to the Bitcoin network through one internet connection. 
or if they don't have an internet connection, they could have um, something called an Iridium Go, which is a, a two-way satellite internet connection. So um, they can use the internet without, um, without having some kind of cable um, plugged into their home. Um, another solution that they might have is just um, SMS. So they could receive those transactions from this mesh network to uh, a mobile phone. The internet um, network is down, but the SMS network is available. They can send each one of those transactions in parts uh, as SMS um, to somewhere else, perhaps somewhere else in the world or somewhere else in the country where that person has a connection to the internet and then they relay that to the internet and to the Bitcoin miners. Um, and then potentially another solution to that is if you had somebody with a amateur radio, ham radio, they could receive those transactions, bundle them up and then broadcast them over the, over the radio connection to somebody that has an internet connection or just directly to the miners. But like you've got that, that, that two kind of ends of the network. So the, the, the first one is uh, downloading the blockchain and verifying transactions and that's handled by Blockstream Satellite. And at the other edge, um, you've got relaying the transactions to the network. And at that point, you need somebody with an internet connection. Okay. In the middle, so, you've got the mesh, the mesh network. Mm -hmm. So basically you're saying there's always a possibility if there's people with a little bit of technical experience and expertise or whatever, or knowledge or, you know, how to do it, because it's not, I guess this is not for average, you know, people who, who can set up, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, something like that. Really? Right? Yeah. Really, so, yeah. I mean, yeah. So if, uh, if you think about it, like your internet connection, you have no idea how that works. Um, uh, yeah, so you're, you, um, you have no idea how your internet connection works and you uh, um, speak to and uh, I, you go to an ISP and the ISP provides you the internet. You don't need to know. And they do that because you're going to pay them a fee. And in the same way, like if there is this situation, there is going to be a demand for um, Bitcoin usage and, um, uh, and people will demand relays. And if there's demand there, then the, um, anybody running a relay could potentially run a business out of that. So they could charge a fee fee to be able to tr send a transaction over the network, for instance. Um, and there's some really cool ways of doing that, which I mentioned in the presentation and also in the tweet storm. Um, so um, using uh, partially signed Bitcoin transactions, you can construct a, um, a transaction in two parts. Mm -hmm. So if I'm sending the transaction to you, I would like say like send um, 0 0.01 Bitcoin to you, but then I could also add um, a relay fee of 0 0.001 Bitcoin, um, which can be picked up by anybody that relays that transaction. And the way that I do that is that I create two outputs in a transaction and um, the, the second output, I send that to a public private key. So the private key is known, but the only way for anybody to be able to spend that is for them to relay the entire transaction onto the internet. So it kind of incentivizes this, this, kind, of, this kind of activity. Um, I think also when you're um, in a country where um, uh, times are difficult and um, people are having a hard time for, for whatever reason, there's also just kind of a lot of um, reciprocity and um, um, people kind of doing good things for each other. Um, for instance, I think in Iran, um, previously when the internet was shut down, there were people relaying tweets via SMS to people that were connected to the internet. Um, for the, those tweets to go out so that like messages were able to reach the, the wider world. And I'm not sure if people were, were charging money to do that. People were probably just doing it because they, they believed in the cause. And um, you could expect that happening with Bitcoin too. But it, even if it didn't, there would be a business there for somebody if they were interested in taking it. Right, right. I get it. Yeah, gotcha. So um, it's a pretty good transition, I think, to this um, uh, subtopic, um, because I like that tweet that you did on January 30th. Um, you wrote, what's bad? Custody, surveillance, poor security. And then you wrote, okay, now make, now make tools that make the opposite of these things easy. Making the tools successfully is hard, but imagining that these tools might exist in the future is not that hard. So um, Neil, I think uh, I have a good feeling with you. I think we have we are on the same page when it comes to, you know, um, uh, alleviate or what do you call it, uh, transitioning or, or accelerating, smoothening the, the, the access to this to this technology um, to the average user out there. So, do you are you also on the, on the conviction 
that it is possible to make it easier. Uh, whether we're talking about user experience, user interface, by default functions and features, um, uh, tools, technological tools. What do you think in general about critical adoption and, and you know, making the tools? Yeah, um, so I, I think these days a lot of people like discuss how do we um, drive Bitcoin adoption. And I think that's, I keep on feeling that's the wrong way to approach the problem. Like who is the we um, and like why are we driving, driving like all of these other people that perhaps don't want Bitcoin right now to, to, to use it. Um, I think it's far more interesting to think from a different angle, which is here's this awesome invention that can solve a lot of people's problems. How do I create a service that solves people's problems? Like, in a new way with, with Bitcoin and there's like business opportunities there. So like rather than this like kind of selfless act where we kind of all just kind of like talk about UX and like how Bitcoin needs to be easier and, and, and stuff like that. That's like actually like personally either contribute or like um, ourselves um, build tools that um, allow people to solve problems in their lives with, 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 with Bitcoin. And, like one of the biggest drivers for Bitcoin adoption right now is number go up. And it, it's, it always has been, and it sure, will continue yeah. to be for, for, a, for a long time. And you like no amount of improving like wallet UX or like making payments easier or um, improving um, privacy or anything like that is going to drive people to use Bitcoin more than their, their fiat options. What's going to drive people to use Bitcoin is the fact that Bitcoin doesn't uh, depreciate in the in the way that fiat inevitably does, and um, people are going to move to Bitcoin to protect their savings, and they're also going to move to Bitcoin to get rich quick. Uh, it's why I got into Bitcoin. Um, I have a lot of friends in the industry, and the majority—I'm not going to say everybody—but the majority got into it in the first place um, because um, the number goes up. And so, like, um, I think if people are building services that like make Bitcoin easier, they should be um, making services that help people kind of benefit from that. And like, obviously security is a, a really big, a big thing there. I think people that are purchasing Bitcoin do care about privacy. Um, and even if they don't now, there will be events in the future where people get burned by using bad privacy. Uh, for instance, kind of governments taking action against them, criminals taking actions, action against them, um, that will like kind of put privacy to the forefront of people's mind. Um, and at that time, if you've built a service that has privacy built into it, um, for like Bitcoin savings, for instance, um, you're going to you're going to profit. You're gonna you're gonna do well. Um, and uh, and in terms of driving adoption outside of the number go up. I think it's all about like, okay, so I've got this great tool. What are some problems in the world that this, this can solve? Um, and then how do I make my service easy to use? So like right now, um, if you've got, uh, uh, if you want to like kind of set up a Bitcoin node, it's, it's very difficult, but do people actually want to set up Bitcoin nodes? No, they like, um, perhaps want to, um, send Bitcoin to, um, a live streamer online. Um, because like international payment methods um, are very difficult to integrate for a streaming platform and require all sorts of KYC, AML, and you probably need, if you want to like provide it to 10 different countries, you probably need four different payment processes to be able to handle that. Um, so like, okay, this solves a, a big problem, allows all these international people to, to make payments to, the, to their favorite YouTube stars or, or, or live stream stars or whatever, like build a platform that allows people to to do that and then like package up the node in there um, uh, or like um, if you're building a wallet, make sure that the node is running in the background some, um, um, in an automated fashion. Um, it doesn't have to be like, okay, like you deal with all of that like complicated stuff and then start using my service. You can make all of that stuff easier for the person like as part of the package of like using your, 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 your platform or whatever. Which would be the I don't think I explained that great. I don't think I explained that very well, but basically like this stuff can be abstracted. Every single part of the Bitcoin 
kind of um, 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 user process can be abstracted. And uh, like it, it applies to the internet. The internet was very difficult to connect to. And in the past, setting up email was a lot more difficult. Now it's a couple of clicks. Like all, there's no reason why people should have to manage payment channels. There's no reason why they should have to manage liquidity. There's no reason why they should like have to download a node launcher and like buy a bunch of like a dedicated device and install all that stuff and go to GitHub. And that, like all of that can be automated and handled in the background. And like, I, I think these days a lot of people are saying you can't use Bitcoin properly. Um, Bitcoin is, is going to be difficult to find mainstream adoption because it's difficult for normal people to use it properly. Thank you but for like, saying that. Thank you for saying that, Neil. <laughs> yeah, like no, that, because, that used because, to be the case for the internet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not. It's not now. Because I have the feeling, you know, I've been observing this uh, whole discussion on the Bitcoin community space on Twitter. It's like there are, you know, a number of people. Um, I mean, I, I do get it. You know, the people have a sense of self responsibility. They need to educate themselves. I get that, but it's. I think it's a sort of a hubris of arrogance to say, you know. People should take the time. People don't have the time. Maybe they don't even have the intellectual, technical, you know, level. And, and I, I, I belong to those people, you know. So I'm, I'm trying, you know, that this is also what the podcast is for, is like to break these things down, to ask the question, why, what can be done, you know, um, more efficient? Um, how can we make it more accessible, um, you know, alleviate the pain points? <laughs> and um, yeah, so, so the more, you know, the more reason that, it makes me happy when, when, for example, projects and companies like Blockstream come out with a with a with a you know with a product or service that is easy accessible, that is easy to use, that where the user interface, the user experience is really wonderful, and uh, brings me to that you know to this other point where Jack Mullers now j just came out with his at least it's now in, you know whatever in the beginning phase with his strike, where he, in his article also elaborates on why. How, how this process, you know, uh, you know, was it was it was evolved so, sort of, and how he developed the, the strike and what what questions he had to ask himself and put himself into the shoes of the of the average user. So, um, do you think? Uh, do you do you know like you you know like Jack Mallet's strike? I mean, you're familiar with with what what it does. So um, I, I I was not familiar with. The, I mean, I I saw the announcement on Twitter, but I didn't click into it unfortunately. Um, so I, I took like five, 10 minutes before our call because you mentioned we might um, discuss it. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 like I'm totally on board with um, his idea of abstracting all of the, the kind of node management and the channel management, like it's possible. And I think it's great that he's doing that. I mean, he's even abstracting the kind of the whole exchange process as well. Mm -hmm. It's like a very smooth user experience however like as a caveat to the tweets that i was posting out i was like these these are some of the the, the bad things right it's like custody surveillance and bad yeah. security yeah and like strike seems to be extremely dependent on banks exactly and um yeah. and like it's it's a, so if you if you're if you got fiat at one end and then you send it over bitcoin and then they receive and they they, they convert and liquidate businesses generally do have to liquidate because bitcoin's too volatile right now like you're really only using bitcoin as the payment method rather than the the medium of exchange um and then you've got custody involved on both sides because of the the, the fiat angle um you've got a lot of surveillance because of all the the fiat involved there um like security i'm guessing it's probably all right jack Miles seems right by all reports he's a very competent developer um but yeah the, the the custody and the surveillance isn't isn't like part of the bitcoin ethos and i i think that could pose problems to a service like that in the future like you're going to like all of the problems that kyc and aml create in the fiat system are now carried over to your to your bitcoin system uh yeah uh, so like personally i'd like to see more bitcoin only um solutions because i i honestly think that outside of kind of savings and number goes up and get rich quick there are like increasing the um uh, areas of the economy that could benefit from using bitcoin um i think uh good examples of that would be like banking the debanked 
So like you've got um, um, legal drug dispensaries in the US, for instance, um, regardless of how you feel about things like that, uh, they have trouble um, setting up and maintaining bank accounts. Mm -hmm. And like you need a business that has wide profit margins to be able to use Bitcoin um, or Bitcoin only uh, because of Bitcoin's volatility. But I think the, the cannabis market probably falls into that category. And then of course, you've got like kind of a lot of dark industry, like illegal drugs, uh, prostitution, uh, porn and stuff like that. Again, they're, they're having a hard time with um, uh, setting up bank accounts. Like Bitcoin could uh, really kind of solve a lot of their problems there. And again, maybe they have to increase their margins to be able to uh, uh, um, operate with a, a Bitcoin model, but um, it's better than not operating at all because you can't save any fiat payments. You can't receive any fiat payments, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And then gambling as well, of course. Like, right. I mean, there's already a huge gambling market for Bitcoin mm -hmm. already. Like the, the Bitcoin gambling platforms are, are thriving. So um, it's kind of evidence that there's, there's, there's stuff there. I think gaming as well is, um, there's a lot more kind of discussion around Twitter now about um, how uh, uh, Bitcoin and gaming can be um, fused like one of the things with uh, gaming is that, especially online gaming, is it's international. Like you'll, if you enter a, a game, you're probably going to be playing against like people from China and Korea and the US and Europe. And um, like, if you ever want to set up any kind of kind of competitive gaming where there's uh, um, uh, payments going going in and out, like uh, it's very difficult to, to integrate with enough payment platforms to cover the entire world. Uh, maybe even impossible, especially when you include China. Whereas if you just do a, a Bitcoin integration immediately, you can accept all customers anywhere in the world. You kind of offload the, the difficulty of getting hold of the Bitcoin to the user for sure. But like that isn't that much of a problem these days. Like there's more and more exchanges, more and more brokers, more and more wallets where you can just do quick buy. So like, I think there's all sorts of these like kind of niche niches where um, Bitcoin can play a role, uh, make life, people's lives easier. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I, I think that that's a, another area that can be, can be developed. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to those two points. Cause this is, this is, the, these are the critical points. Yeah. You said it's cust custodial when we're talking, whatever we're talking about, Jack Mallet strike, uh, app, uh, yeah, which is at the end of the day, it's connected to a bank card, uh, to a bank account or a debit card. So it's custodial. So, yeah. uh, and, and you've got, yeah, you've got this, uh, threat or, or I don't know what to call it, the risk of, um, surveillance. What if people like, for example, in Austria, um, uh, cannabis, um, is illegal. I mean, you have, you have cannabis shops, uh, but people who go there buy themselves the plant. It's that's legal because it has like whatever, uh, less than 0.3% uh, THC. So that's legal. Uh, it's really ridiculous. It's it's totally irrational. It's schizophrenic uh, drug policy. But um, and, and I'm totally up, you know for for I mean I you know I have no problem saying that I'm totally for a rational uh, legalization and regulation. But um, so, do you have any creative idea how we can uh, how we can really make that um, non custodial the the fiat end of it? Like, could that be like a in between transition, something you know, like a semi custodial, you know, like a non custodial fiat fund where then it's sort of um, debited, you know, or, or charged. So I'm, I'm really negative on fiat. Um, so I worked at a, an exchange, OKCoin, okay um, and then um, subsequently worked in the cross border payments um, space using Bitcoin as an intermediary to. Um, like convert US dollars into renminbi and deliver to deliver deliver to China, um, and I, I, like I discovered that like whether I was doing business development or marketing, pretty much fifty percent plus of my day was um, spent dealing with regulations. As soon as you touch fiat currencies, you you come under all sorts of very nasty, very very strict regulations, mm -hmm. and they restrict your business. They force you to contort into all sorts of arbitrary positions to make things work. Um, every time that you engage with a client, you have to first kind of, I mean, aside from the 
KYC and AML. You have to work out like their KYC AML situation, yours, and then any other jurisdictions that like you guys cover, and then like work out how you can make a business model fit. Um, and I just I'm completely convinced that anybody that's trying to create um, law surveillance, um, uh, non-custodial uh, um, solutions with fiat is fighting a losing battle. Like the the reason why Bitcoin is so important, the reason why um, Bitcoin will continue to gain adoption is because it doesn't fall within that paradigm. And solutions that are successful are people that are taking advantage of not being caught in inside that regulatory trap. Um, so of course, exchanges don't really have a choice. Like you, you need to create on and off ramps for people. And if you're touching fiat, like you just got, you just got to deal with that. You've got to do what you're told basically, um, or you get shut down. That said, like, like you do have interesting solutions like um, BISC and HODL HODL, which create a bit of um, resilience and some alternatives there. Um, but yeah, as soon as you're touching fiat, it becomes a much more dangerous game. Whereas if you're a Bitcoin business, not only um, is the regulatory landscape a lot um, less developed around Bitcoin and may continue to stay that way, let's say that it doesn't, you, or, you can always remain mobile. Um, your business can shift can change your jurisdiction to somewhere that's more friendly to Bitcoin and you can still continue to service the entire world. Um, uh, yeah. So like, um, I think, um, trying to do anything with the fiat side of things is very, very difficult. And it's, it's, it's more important to focus on, um, Bitcoin only stuff like users, if they have enough demand for either your service. So for example, like Silk Road, you will get people that will go out of their way to purchase Bitcoin just so that they can purchase their drugs, right? Um, if they want to um, uh, enjoy number goes up and, and get rich quick, um, they will go out of their way to buy some Bitcoin. So like, it's, it's more important to just create compelling services that use Bitcoin only, rather than trying to like work out that on-ramp thing because the, the, the users will work that out themselves. Mm, gotcha, okay. Um, the thing is, I mean, okay, I mean, I understand the process, uh, the thought process and the development process of Jack Muller. He said, you know, how can he somehow make people, uh, you know, go into this uh, smooth transaction process, but without even thinking about Bitcoin, they don't want to go into 17 steps of setting up something and then here and then there. So, um, is there any kind of a creative possibility to, to not to circumvent, but to, uh, even if they have, okay, you take, okay, I take some fiat, put it into a, put it into a, into my own escrow lightning. I mean, this is really just a brainstorming with you. And then it automatically converts that to, to Bitcoin without even, you know, having the user know, knowing about it. But is there, is there any, any possibility to, you know, tackle this problem? Um, I mean, it, it sounds like you need something like Tether. Uh, I think Tether kind of, um, it, for now, um, provides a, a kind of a fiat alternative where you're not exposed to Bitcoin-like volatility. Um, um, you just have to um, trust the, uh, the, the, the Tether um, fiat custody. But like, there's no way that you personally could... Um, I kind of lock fiat away without giving up um, um, custody of the of the of the asset. You can't do fiat multi sig, right? Um, so could liquid work? Liquid or blockstream? Could that work? Like if you put uh, so that I'm, integrated, co-integrated into Strike, could that work? I, 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 I sorry, I'm not following how the how the integration would work. Um, so I mean, Tether is already available on Liquid, so people okay. can purchase Tether from um, the various sources that provide it, for example, Bitfinex, and um, and then use Tether on the Liquid Network. There's more and more places that are accepting it these days. Um, they can also issue their own fiat tokens. So you could have like a, a decentralized market of um, fiat custody with uh, token issuance. Um, that That is possible. You could have like 10, 20, 30 stable coin issuers all kind of uh, competing against each other but again like you're getting into some very regulatory hot waters whenever you issue a stable coin um and like 
it's very brave to do that. Um, Tether have been around for a long time and seem to have worked it out for the most part. Um, a few others like um, Circle and stuff have got something going on there, but uh, yeah, it's it's a very difficult space to to to, to work in. As well, like if you're a um, if you're an escrow provider or, or or whatever, like you you also fall under some pretty serious regulations, and and if you're tokenizing whatever's under escrow, like again, like that's technically creating a security and you may fall under some really nasty stuff in the U S especially. So it's, um, this is the thing with regulations. Like they, they force you to kind of consider all sorts of things that like are not particularly productive to the user or, or anybody really. Um, and one of the reasons to avoid, avoid fiat and stick to Bitcoin. <laughs> okay. So the privacy aspect of it is also, I mean, interesting to me, like, uh, what if the customer or, you know, the, someone who's, who would use, let's just say, you know, this Jack Mahler strike would, would go into a shop and doesn't just wants to be a, stay anonymous. I mean, he, you know, he makes a transaction, but just wants to stay anonymous. Uh, but okay, you know, I can, I can still, I'm going to have a talk hopefully soon with Jack Mahler uh, in Hanoi at the crypto economy conference and ask him all these questions how he envisions that, I mean, also for the future. Um, Cause there, you know, that's one of the first questions I got from people around me. It's like, okay, you know what? No problem. I can download the app. I can pay, uh, but I want to stay anonymous. I don't, you know, not because it's illegal. They just, you know, they just want to keep the privacy. They just don't want anybody yeah. to know that they just purchased a, a cannabis plant in a can, in a legal, you know, legally in a cannabis shop. So, uh, you know, just for the sake of privacy. But, you know, these are questions, I guess, that has to have to be worked out. Yeah. Um, like, uh, yeah. Uh, I think if you if you want to implement private solutions, you're going to need to make sure that you're providing full node services to the user in an abstracted way. Um, and hopefully, increasingly, people are going to start using privacy technologies such as coin joins. Maybe we'll get confidential transactions one day if people if people approve of that like um those kind of stuff need to be built in by default and like i reject anybody that says that there's no demand for privacy like if if an application is easy to use user friendly does everything that you want it to and in addition it provides um uh, private transactions you will gain users because it may not be like top of their list of priorities but like it's a nice to have for them for sure so i mean you see that very much with things like WhatsApp and Telegram, like um, people may be fine like sending messages over Facebook, which has got uh, barely any encryption or none at all. Um, but they will prefer to use WhatsApp for communications for personal stuff um, because it has it has the encryption. And like the people like WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram would not have introduced encryption options unless there was demand for it. And so like, yeah, I, I think um, wallets and stuff that keep this in mind will probably succeed over the ones that, that don't. And even if, they, and even if they're not as big as the kind of the wallets with plenty of surveillance on them, um, they will uh, provide to a niche of users that do care. And it'll be impossible to get those niche users to, to go across to the, to the um, less private options. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to security and privacy or, you know, hodling Bitcoin, uh, you just, you know, probably heard just recently that uh, it's not nothing new, nothing newsworthy, actually, because it's, 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 it's it just confirmed that the Trezor Harbor wallet can be extracted with, you know, some technical advice and expertise. Uh, so there are some precaution measures people have to take who have a Trezor 1 or Trezor T and you know, put on a, a passphrase and and uh, you know uh, uh, ensure that there's no physical access to the treasure. So people already have these problems, you know, uh, with with the hardware wallet. And now thinking about you know uh, coin joining or privacy and you know all these other features and operations, it's uh, it's overwhelming. So this is, I guess, where, where do you see where do you see this this development going? Do, do you see like a light at the end of the tunnel, like for for these kind of developments to make it more user friendly? Um, blockstream. So I mean, 
Trezor, Trezor is already um, a massive improvement on what uh, what went before, right? So before Trezor, everybody had to set up their own um, uh, Bitcoin Core wallet or Armory wallet on a separated offline device, maybe an old laptop or something like that. It, way more hassle. And now, now there's a Trezor that like abstracts a lot of the security process. It um, provides lots of um, prompts in the UI to make sure that the user is doing the correct thing, recording the seed phrase correctly, it reminds people to test the seed phrase and stuff like that. So it's like implementing a lot of security best practices just through the UI. And like that's after, so what, we're at 11 years now. So I think like any of the the problems around Trezor, for instance, um, the, 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 the physical risk of owning a Trezor can be mitigated by having a passphrase. Um, and like people can provide solutions for passphrases or maybe the passphrase on its own is just sufficient. Um, and as long as the software is prompting people to do that, I don't think it's um, any more difficult than setting up a bank account is today. Um, so like, um, I mean, um, other examples that you provided there, uh, aside from kind of protecting your treasure, uh, recording the seed and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Like, um, I think for example, CASA have experimented with a solution, which is seedless backups, where you, you're using multiple devices in a multi seed configuration. And that allows, so as long as you're checking like on a regular basis, that those devices are available. Um, you know, you always have access to your funds and you can take out one of those devices and replace it if it's lost or damaged. And there's no kind of need to record the, 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 the seed phrase. And I think CASA like provide a lot of support through their, their services. I mean, they charge for it, but, um, uh, it kind of helps people get started. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a so, big fan of I'm a big like, fan of, and, of and Casa because it's all in one package. You got your full node, your key master, your multi sig, your uh, right. So it's yes, and that's like I mean that's that version one product, right? We're mm -hmm. we're still in the very early stages. Um, they may choose to like focus on one part, like going forward, like I said, ten years in the future or something. They may just be focusing on one part of that that that, that whole um, package. Um, and then a bunch of other competitors have moved into the market to kind of deal with everything else and make that easier too. Um, but I, I just, I don't know, like the, already, like if you ask me to brainstorm on um, uh, how to improve the CASA service or like make Trezor storage easier, like I could sit down and brainstorm a bunch of ideas and like a couple of them would probably improve things. Um, and like this, this market's going to, keep on developing more like Trezor is going to have more and more competitors who are going to try different things. And some of them are going to be worse. Some of them are going to be better, but like, it's just, uh, it's a case of progression. And like the industry is quite early. Like there's no reason to expect that the state of Bitcoin node operations and, um, storage and, um, Bitcoin coin joins, for instance, there's no reason to expect them to stay at the current level of complexity. It can do, they can be made a lot easier. And in the end, it may just be a case of like, okay, I send you Bitcoin and all of the coin joining and like the decision whether to send it over Bitcoin main chain or, or the lightning network or even something like the liquid network, like all of that will be handled by machine logic in the background. Um, and all, all we see is like Bitcoin from my wallet into your wallet. And like um, in terms of the custody side of things, like, people will care like, is it custodial or is it non-custodial? Does it have surveillance or does it not have surveillance? Mm -hmm. And like whether they'll investigate it themselves and audit the code, probably not, but there will be people that will do that. Like the, the super geeks and um, people like you and me will probably care more than most. And like, if we do see red flags and stuff like that, that information will filter down to the regular users and probably um, kind of change their minds or um, encourage them to, to look at alternatives that are more in line with kind of Bitcoin principles. Gotcha. Uh, um, Neil, uh, what is your perception? I mean, uh, do you think um, more, um, you know, institutional investors are coming into this space, are more open-minded, especially the old school macroeconomists ma or macro investors, um, you know, or net high ultra net worth uh, people? Uh, is that your perception? I mean, 
is it slowly like accelerating the, the open-mindedness? I mean, the, but, yeah, I, uh, from, from getting into the industries now, like I, I've seen nothing but acceleration, even in bear markets, like there is just a steady kind of um, uh, march of adoption and awareness and understanding. So the amount of people that get Bitcoin, and why it exists, uh, the problem of like kind of trust trustfulness in the central banking system, like more and pe more more and more people get that, and it's not people that already get it get into Bitcoin. It's like bit, by getting into Bitcoin, usually for like getting rich quick, they start to learn about everything else. Um, and in terms of the institutional investors, I find just from my own anecdotal experience chatting to people at conferences. Um, I find them in general, there are a few people that like do really, really kind of get it, but in general, they're probably the, the slowest learners because they come from like they're, 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 if you're any kind of like wealth manager or anything like that, you, your, your entire paradigm, the, 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 the strategies that you've used to um, get rich have been done within the fiat infrastructure where like inflation is a given, it's always happening. Stocks always go up. Real estate prices always go up. And so well, it's very difficult for them to come around to a new paradigm where it's like, okay, so Bitcoin will change how all of that works. And that, that system is broken for all of these reasons. And Bitcoin is a better alternative for all of these reasons. And they, they, they just instinctually kind of reject that. And also they're generally institutions or institutions because they've been successful and continue to be successful. Um, so they don't like being told how things work or like that they need to be humble and learn. Whereas a lot of kind of like us grassroots folk, like we came in not knowing anything about finance or the or central banking or the economy and kind of learned from, from our exposure to Bitcoin. Um, so yeah, like I, I think they, they do get it eventually, but I think they're, they're getting it a lot more slowly. And you'll see that with like institutional portfolios and the kind of, um, the projects that they'll engage with. Uh, there's a lot of shit coining going on, a lot of kind of open mindedness about um, <laughs> centralized blockchain projects, um, like outright scammers, uh, like um, Jeb McCaleb with um, Stellar and stuff like that, given like time to pitch their ideas and these very large, very previously very reliable institutions, like are building um, projects on top of these very kind of shaky foundations run by some fairly dodgy people. So yeah, I think you see that kind of expressed through those kind of activity. Um, but eventually everybody comes around, right? Because if you, yeah. if you make the wrong decisions in Bitcoin, you, you lose money. And if you make the right ones, you, um, you do very well. Um, I <laughs> think we're going to make their own pain experiences. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Painful. Exactly. So uh, what do you think about Jack Dorsey? Do you think he's, uh, he's like, a, I have a good feeling with Jack Dorsey. I think he's a really, he, he lives those ethical principles that he preaches about, you know, when he talks about Bitcoin, um, doing these, those projects in Africa, where do you see this going? Um, so I, I don't know anything about the projects in Africa, but the Square Crypto initiative that he set up um, mm -hmm. appears to be amazing. Like uh, it's yet another, um, institution um organization set up within the space just purely dedicated to producing um open source code so you've got like at the moment you've got blockstream contributing you've got chain code doing loads um you've got uh, uh um, digital garage crypto garage um in japan they're producing a lot of open source stuff um and then we've got uh, square crypto so it's like um yeah it's it, it's very charitable, right? Like these people aren't like making anything up off it apart from like building up some really good knowledge capital at the company on this um, potentially very valuable technology in the future. Um, uh, but like for the most part, it's just like these great contributions to making Bitcoin awesome. So um, uh, yeah, the square crypto thing looks great. Uh, I'm interested to see what happens in terms of kind of, uh, they've got like the cash app, whether like they start building more services on top of that or whether they like set up their own new application for pure Bitcoin stuff. Because like I said, it's very difficult to do new and exciting things when you're connected to, to fiat in any way. So, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see 
where that goes. Fascinating. Um, so for conclusion, um, Neil, what, do you have like, is there a roadmap? I mean, can you talk about like the roadmap of Blockstream? Like, are there any ideas for the future in development? Can, is there anything you, you, you can talk about? Um, so I will continue um, focusing on Bitcoin. Um, contributing to projects that um, um, make uh, Bitcoin better. Uh, like the majority of our focus right now is building out the liquid network. And I think that will continue for the next few years. So um, right now, um, in terms of, we spoke about exchanges on ramps and off ramps, there's like this very big threat of, um, if we see another Bitcoin bull run, we've got a lot more people to onboard this, like every Bitcoin bull run, People say it's going to happen after the halvening. Um, it's an even bigger cohort of people coming into um, Bitcoin. And so we have the potential for some serious um, um, congestion on the Bitcoin main chain. Like it was pretty bad in 2017. Like if we have another one, it could be even worse. And um, that can create all sorts of kind of very inefficient market dynamics where it's very difficult for people to get um, into the system, people that want to buy can't buy, people that want to sell can't sell, and we get these kind of crazy bubbles, and um, some some people just can't get access when they need to. Um, Liquid offers like a really good kind of like um, um, alternative to moving all of that speculative exchange um, activity over to somewhere where it's more suited. Like there's no reason why a lot of those transactions they're getting written to the blockchain forever, right? Um, people are already trusting the exchanges with custody. Um, there's a lot of trust involved anyway. Um, with Liquid, they can offload some of that to a federation instead. Um, and then also um, enjoy like probably lower transaction fees, faster transactions, and then not clog up the, the main chain for kind of um, other economic activity that perhaps benefits from the trustlessness more. Um, so yeah, I think we will see more stuff on the on the liquid side. We'll continue to so all of the liquid developments happen on elements too. So anybody that like thinks they can make an improved version of a federated sidechain can use elements to set up their own. So I hope uh, going forward we'll see some kind of um, third party private um, um, sidechains being set up. Um, we also have like a lot of lightning development going on. That's like purely kind of open source development at the moment, but I think that could uh, uh, turn into um, some interesting commercial projects um, in the future too. And um, also like, I mean, for instance, this year, we've got a bunch of announcements on the satellite side. Uh, we've got satellite kits coming out, which is kind of a key part of making it easy for people to access these really? offline networks. Wow. Um, so people will be able to buy off the shelf kits with everything that they need, uh, uh, set up um, their own sat node. Um, and as that comes out, we'll be launching a big update to the service, which makes it more functional. I can't give any details right now, but um, right. It'll, be, um, it'll be a big benefit to these offline networks. Um, we're working on so much stuff, it's very difficult to kind of, um, uh, to, to, yeah, so Blockstream Green as well. Um, Celine Jin um, is, and the Blockstream Green team have been doing really good work on, um, not only integrating liquid into the system, but um, uh, making it more usable. Um, I think like Box uh, the green address app had a reputation for not having particularly good UX. That's kind of changing with Boxstream Green. So I think um, that will continue to um, grow in its user base and um, get a bit, a bit more user friendly. Um, yeah. That's exciting. There's a, there's wow, a satellite kits. <laughs> that sounds pretty Yeah, exciting. satellite kits, are, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be very popular. We're trying to guess how many kits we need to prepare right now. So I hope we um, have enough that we don't sell okay. out immediately. Uh, but yeah, I think well, they're going to be Can popular. I ask you like, what is the price range? I mean, do you estimate? Uh, I can't say it right now. Um, right, some right. of the parts are still being developed, but we'll, mm -hmm. we'll have some details very soon. I think we'll probably do some um, uh, kind of pre-sales or uh, kind of um, uh, some kind of waiting list system okay. just to help us judge, judge, mm -hmm. judge the expected numbers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Neil, before we wrap this up, let me ask you about this Blockstream Green Wallet. I'm a huge fan of Blockstream Green Wallet. I think it has a pretty cool, you know, uh, UX, UI. And my girlfriend has it too, um, because she's, we're still waiting for the Casa too, you know, our first Casa. 
and uh, and she doesn't have a hardware wallet yet. So there are some people who might recommend that the blockstream be wallet, and I think it's great. You know, uh, would you would you say to someone? I mean, if someone asks you, you know, uh, if I don't have a hardware wallet, but I do have a blockstream green wallet, uh, just from a security perspective, um, as long as let's say you know nobody has physical access to your wallet, you know, to your mobile phone or to your wallet. Would you say this is the same security level as a hardware wallet? I mean, it's maybe it's a naive question. Uh, no, uh, no, I would definitely not use those words. That is the same security as a hardware wallet. There's trade-offs for sure. Um, okay. The best thing that you can do with a green wallet is combine it with a hardware wallet, which is um, totally possible. Um, you can have uh, uh, the, the your keys stored on the on the Trezor, and then uh, another. So every green wallet is a two of two wallet, right? Um, and the other keys held on the green server, which are um, activated by the two uh, FA. So at that point, you're getting even better security than a, a hardware wallet. Um, uh, yeah, so like it, it, it's different. I would still, for any large amounts of Bitcoin, I would still recommend people use a hardware wallet. Um, but for um, spending money, um, a box a Blockstream green wallet is definitely um, a good option. I mean, I use Blockstream green as well. Um, and I'm pretty pretty sensitive about yeah. Uh, yeah. the applications that I'm using. Mm -hmm. All right, Neil, thank you so much for your time. But uh, before we wrap up, uh, do you want to uh, direct some, you know, mark listeners to some uh, resources, literature, books, links, uh, besides, you know, your Twitter handle? Cool. So yeah, my Twitter handle is nwoodfine. Um, if people want to learn more about um, the satellite service, uh, we've got. Um, a uh, pretty comprehensive lander page at blockstream.com slash satellite. Um, and then, of course, if you're on the website, you can check out all of the, the other services that we have available there. Um, I think that's that's about it. Yeah, great. I really enjoyed this talk, Neil. So, yeah, good luck with your projects and hope to get you back soon. Maybe even, you know, meet you at some conference, hopefully. Um, and, yeah. Keep up the good work, Neil. Thank you so much again. Great. Thanks very much, Kevin. Catch you later. Bye-bye. All right. What do you think about this awesome, fascinating interview talk with Neil Woodfine? Um, I didn't know that we were going to talk about, you know, a spectrum of topics, really super important topics that we need to address. Um, anyway, check out his Twitter handle is and Woodfine. And I'm going to put this all in the show notes, please. Uh, if you love this show, uh, leave me a positive review, uh, like, subscribe, share, um, you know, retweet, whatever you do. Thanks so much for support, for listening. If you have any feedback questions or, you know, for my next episodes um, or, or whom to interview, let me know and drop me a message or write me uh, to my email address, hello at the totalconnector.com. And hope you really enjoyed this talk and let me know what you think. All right. Have a good day.